Hi, welcome to Art Talk. I'm your host, Jim Tripp, in the spirit of art. Today our guest is Webster Terhune. 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 All right, I wanted to get that right. I'm sorry. And he's the uh, coordinator for the uh, Lyman Allen Arts Tour that's about to start. Uh, welcome, Webster. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let's talk about this tour. What's going on with it? Well, there are about 13 artists which are being highlighted by the Lyman Allen Studio Tour. 13. Now, what this is all about is this. Uh, an individual mm -hmm. is able to purchase a ticket um, that goes for about $10 mm -hmm. uh, at various places, one of them being the Lyman Allen Museum. And they are able to, on October 8th, go into the artist's studio and see the place where they created their work. Okay. The more more in-depth view of the artist. It's a view of the artist, but it's also a very revealing thing of the work in general. You, when you see where a piece of work or where a type of work is being done, mm -hmm. then you understand it much better. Okay. Because you are seeing it in the natural context in which it's created. I mean, they're in an artist's studio. There is all the personality of the artist is already written into the walls. And all the influences that is going to influence that artist is also written into the walls. So when you view the work, a you know, a, whether it be a piece of sculpture or whether it be a painting, and you see it in that context, there is an intimacy which far transcends any other situation, including the best gallery or the best museum. Mm -hmm. They all pale in comparison to the, the beauty of seeing a, a work of art in somebody's studio. But many artists are very uh, obscure, hard to find. They like to I keep themselves them. alienated. They tried, they tried to hide and they tried to run, but I got them. <laughs> I nailed them. <laughs> Ran them down. That's right. Do, uh, how do they uh, become part of this? Do you, go, you have to seek them I, out? I sought them out. Um, I had uh, a huge list of ours to choose from. Um, Where do you get this list? Well, the, uh, the Mystic Art Association was very forthcoming. Uh, the Lyman Allen Museum also helped out a great deal. Uh, Penny Knowles was instrumental. Also, I was aware of, of, of many artists in the area. And with uh, those three sources, I narrowed it down to a mere uh, 30. Mm -hmm. I chose the ones I chose for a variety of reasons, not because they were necessarily the finest artists in this area, okay. even though they are certainly extraordinary. Each one is extraordinary in their own right. I chose them because of the breadth of their styles. But what about the artists that are out there that aren't involved in these groups? There's next year. That's next year. So clean up your studio because I may be coming around next year, you know, and uh, we'll just have to see. Is there a the, way the, they the, can get see, in touch is, with you or? No, I'll get in touch no. with them. But the, um, the thing to understand is, is that uh, this, the studio tour was not a, um, a sort of a a contest and, say, and okay. people would say to the right or to the left, you're good and you're not. No um, politics. No politics at all. As a matter of fact, there were some artists uh, who uh, I didn't ask to be on this one, mainly because I, I wanted some good artists to be on the next one. Mm -hmm. the, this is going to be a continuing process. And the, the, the hope of this and the hope of the Lyman Allen Museum is to draw attention uh, to the incredible wealth of creativity that exists in this area. It's huge. It's, it, it's, it is. There's a lot of artists here. There is an absurdly large amount of artists in this area. Okay. Uh, now we have uh, two artists that we're going to uh, be seeing, a short clip of them. Uh -huh. uh, do you want to introduce them? Well, the first artist is uh, Sandy Gold. And uh, she, of course, uh, gained national recognition with her mural called Temple of the Soul, which was done in the Westerly uh, Library. Mm -hmm. And then artist after her is an artist named, uh, a sculptor named Lowell Ryland. And he has a huge studio. It's actually a converted bank. And he has uh -huh. that in Westerly. He's doing all right. <laughs> He's doing fine. Bought the bank out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> he bought all the way to the bank. OK, well, let's uh, head up to their studios and check okay. it out. I 
think probably because I have slowed down, although perhaps it's not so obvious to others, but I have slowed way down and taken the time to stop and think about those things that I appreciate. When I was first diagnosed, when I was first diagnosed, of course I went into a depression, I went into a glum, I was, I was not happy at all. But within a matter of months I began to realize that I had to save my life. The doctors said they couldn't do it. And the key word there was they. So I knew I had to. So I began to purge those things in my life that I didn't like, that didn't make me happy, and to surround myself by those things that did. And of course, being an artist, that's what started coming up on, in my pictures. These things of great beauty, these things that gave me joy. I think as an artist, and I can't speak for everyone, but I think we work at every single day expressing ourselves. And I think that's a key word, a key difference, is that we express that, which we feel. And so we're constantly feeling and putting those feelings out there and reflecting on that which we see. So if that changes the way we see things, yes, but it's not something that just artists do. Sandy's studio, a very interesting studio, and she does a, a, a range, it looks like a broad range of uh, style. Yes, Amazing. she does uh, both uh, portraits and she does uh, water scenes. What makes her work really unique is the fact that, unlike many people who will do sort of a panoramic mm -hmm. uh, view of, let's say, of nautical scenes or the ocean, she really focuses on a very, very small part, and it gives it that intimacy. And that is the result of the change that she went through uh, when she was diagnosed uh, uh, having an inoperable brain tumor. Okay, this art for healing's sake, is, is that something new or has that been going on with all artists all the time? Well, th th I think that it's probably been going on for quite some time. I, I think that a variety of artists will do art for a ver variety of reasons. Uh, Sandy found it effective to um, concentrate on her art in order to get over the sentence of death, or at least to get through it. Whether art is able to heal the viewer, I think that if the viewer walks up to a work of art and is ready to be healed, relates. certainly. Yes. If, if it relates. If it relates. If it strikes that chord. Yes. So then the release happens. That's right. But mainly that's art for the artist's sake. Well, um, in this case, uh, that was, is absolutely true. I, this, Sandy really was not thinking of an audience. Mm -hmm. But I think in this case, this is what adds a certain power to it. She was completely immersed in it. So it relieved her stress. It relieved her stress. And uh, that translates, and that, that is such an effective and such a uh, resonant chord in all of us mm -hmm. that we are able to look at it and feel that sympathetic vibration. Passion. Yes. I am not one for art for art's sake. I usually believe that a, an artist has the responsibility to take into account their audience. But in this instance, it was, I think it was remarkable that uh, she was able to, while being so concentrated on just her own opinions, is able to bring in such a wide audience. So you think you should strike at an audience in order to please them? No, I think that an artist has the responsibility to realize that there is a relationship, there is a relationship that involves three different people, three different situations. One, the artist. Okay. Two, the work of art, the medium that, that they're working on. And three, the person who is hopefully going to be able to look at this work and have a translation experience in which they are able to walk into the artist's head and understand, if only vicariously, what led to that artist's inspiration. There I art is a communicative. But that would be in the abstract as far as the person relating to someone else's work. Mm -hmm. So they would have to have that just that stray of abstract uh, left over, traces, so to speak, for that person to follow the path. Yes, it's the translation from a viewer and, and to the artist is always the most problematic 
okay. thing. It's very, very difficult, and yet really good artists and really um, open-minded audience can do it. Okay. And it's always rewarding when that happens. Yes, definitely. Well, that's where it hits. That's right. Uh, we're gonna, do you want to open us up to the next artist? Yes, the next one is uh, Lowell Ryland. And he is a sculptor, and he has a very, very interesting work, and as well as a remarkable studio. Okay. okay. Well, let's go. The images come from nature. Um, they're organic on several levels. There's the actual earth fissure, the actual earth casting, but there's also an abstraction from nature, from things I see around me that's on a conceptual level within the work. In rectangles, the trapezoids, thin triangles, elongated triangular spaces, uh, subtle curves. Um, so in order for mankind to move on into the future, let alone even exist today, we must and we need to absorb the organic and the geometric. The Eastern philosophy, which is the um, spiritual, the mental, and the Western philosophy, which is the very linear, the um, logical formation. Out of all chaos, the dualisms of the world come to unity. And that's when you're in agreement and you shake hands and you go forward in life. And that's why I feel the future is very, very positive and that it will be very successful for all mankind. Okay, this is Lowell Ryland. His work is totally different. Are all your artists so different? Have yes, I tried to provide for the people who were going to go on the tour a wide variety of experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there are some artists who are abstract, like Lowell is, mm -hmm. and there are some artists who are representational. Lowell Ryland is a very, very interesting artist, and this is why I think he is. He, his work combines two very contrastral kinds of experience. One. His, his work has this very severe kind of industrial, Organic. polished uh, polished sort of background to it. Oh, as okay. it it's okay. very, very manufactured. Mm -hmm. And that represents man. man. Okay. And then interspersed among this is this beautifully delicate representation of nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the rock, the cliff. The rocks, the, he the formation. He's from uh, North Dakota. Okay, that's, you could see that. Yeah. Yes. Mountains right yes. there. Yeah. Really in inspired them. Yes, and, and uh, as well as the earth fissures that exist naturally in North Dakota, which are supposedly quite dramatic. So the work isn't very, really abstract. It's, it's not really abstract and because it, it isn't actually, in certain parts of it, are an exact duplication of, of natural nature. formations. However... Which can be just about anything. Which can be just about yes. anything. However, the... the that which he is pointing to mm -hmm. is abstract, but also very heartfelt by most people nowadays. And that is, we have to bring together the, the, this, these two of what seem to be an opposing points of view. One, human beings as great manufacturers industry. and the natural industry and, and the natural process that this world has been existing on for a few billion years. Right. We can no longer afford there to be an separation. A, a separation or even a battle between the two. Man from nature. We do Lowell's, tend to separate ourselves. We do tend to constantly. separate ourselves, and Lowell is showing with his work that actually they can exist in harmony and, and create beauty. Uh, with the strong push towards space, you wonder if that can happen. It's going to have to because uh, no one's going to want to live on the moon or Mars. We're going to have to live right here for an awfully long period long, of time. Long time. So we might as well bury the hatchet with the Earth, you know, instead of trying to use it just to dig huge trenches. Hmm. They say uh, if we do get to Mars, there will be no birds because of the gravity. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be a lot of mist. I'm, uh, I think Mars probably looks a little bit like uh, parts of Arizona, which is fine. Exactly, just like Lowell's time. work, pieces but of that it work. It gets tiresome. You can see it right in there. We're gonna, Lowell really does point to a, 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 a thing that we have to address, and that yes. is harmony. He's ahead of it. He's, he's on it. Yeah. I think he sees what's going on. Mm -hmm. But uh, now Sandy's work, on the other hand, is pointing, uh, pointing to the more inward spiritual release. Yes, very much so. 
uh, even though her work also is, is representational and it represents nature, mm -hmm. it is an internalized representation okay. of nature. Heal yourself before you get out there. Or how about this? The healing of yourself and the addressing of the world outside in general is actually the same process. Right, come together. Yes, yeah, so if you if you uh, if you are so self-centered that you are only healing yourself, then what good are you? You know. Right. On the other hand, if you are to to communicate with the outside world and yet you are f this this festering hive of of the wounded <laughs> animal, of a wounded animal, then all you're going to do is step on people's toes. Right. Sandy had to, in order to communicate with so many people, she had to address what was inside first. Lowell, it's so that the, uh, Lowell is saying, in order for us to exist as a species, we have to come to terms with ourselves as a natural process. So one's inside out, the other's outside in. That's right. Ah, sculpting, painting. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> the best of both possible worlds. It's two different fields. Yes. Hmm. All right. Well, maybe you can give. I had, now, you don't just do studio tours. You, you're well into the arts. You've been involved in quite a bit. For a number of years, I was the curator for the uh, Hoxie Gallery at the Westlake Public Library. Uh, the Hoxie Gallery is the second largest gallery in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. uh, it was built in 1928 almost by accident. Well, they must have quite a collection. Uh, they had quite a collection, which they sold. Yeah. And uh, ah, that hurt. <laughs> So what I've been doing for a n number of years is I've been going out and arranging shows to exist in the gallery. Okay. But you're also an artist and a uh, composer. Yes. Uh, the, uh, I have a degree in art from Cal, Cal Arts, which is mm -hmm. California Institute of the Arts. I also have a degree in, in music composition from the same school. Uh, yeah. I majored in electronic music composition, and, my, and I basically nowadays concentrate, for me personally, That's creatively. That's cutting edge. Yeah. Basically in the music field. I, I interface with computers okay. and, uh, and create uh, musically. Okay, we have to take a short break for a commercial right sure. now, but uh, we'll be back and mm -hmm. continue our conversation. Sounds good. is a process that fills our lives. See it. Enjoy it. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Griffiths Arts Center, New London, Connecticut. Uh, Webster, can you continue with that background? I want to hear more about where you came from. Well, um, I had a curious experience, and that is I, I grew up among the arts mm -hmm. and artists. Uh, my mother uh, is a professor of art history, uh, and she has actually written a number of books on American art. And I grew up in a situation in which from age nine on up, I was constantly being taken uh, to art museums and being shown. Uh, we lived, I lived in Stanford, Connecticut, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, which was close to New York City. And about which is growing like crazy now. Yes, yes, it, it is now. Uh, 
And so about once a month we'd go to the Museum of Modern Art or the Met or the, uh, the Frick or the uh, Whitney and I would get this lecture from my mother who was felt that for some reason every nine-year-old boy should know about art history. I would get an uh, Did that open your mind or did that close you off? Yeah, actually it did. Uh, at first all I liked was the, was the attention and the fact that uh, I was promised that if I did this I'd get ice cream at the end. <laughs> but um, after a while I remember looking at a Matisse painting called The Piano Lesson and I was about 11 and my mother was explaining to me how this painting worked in terms of the energy and in right. terms of certain kinds of color schemes and all of a sudden I remember seeing it, I mean really seeing it, and that was quite seeing dramatic. Seeing past the strokes. Seeing past the strokes, seeing past the image into how a painting and a work of art can work as a visual experience. And from that moment on, I was, it was much easier for me to read a work of art because that is exactly what happens. When you look at a lot of art and you, and this anybody can do it, you don't have to be an artist to do this. Right. If you look at a lot of art and you try to figure out not what the artist was intending, but more importantly, what it, how this work of art translates into an experience. Would it be into time, uh, that particular time, or any experience? I think that uh, there are so many different kinds of things that surround a work of art. A lot of times, uh, the time that it's painted in is very important. Okay. Uh, certainly Impressionism uh, is like that and before. Uh, but also there's a certain universality and, 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 that, and that, um, that experience can translate across time. Every individual, art is not something that you have to be an artist or a connoisseur to understand. That's a terrible, terrible misunderstanding. It leaves That's a lot of people line. out. It leaves a lot of people out and there's no reason for it. Art is the most human experience available. In fact, it's the only human experience that is right. particularly human. It's pure human. You know, I mean, how many dogs do you see? You know, <laughs> well, uh, I've seen the uh, animals paint uh, elephants and monkeys. <laughs> Wait a minute, they've tried it all. But anyway, um, so I, I, my natural direction actually was was music composition, and I went to Juilliard for a while, and I translated from uh, transferred from Juilliard to Cal Arts. Uh, mainly because I wanted to school, go to school out in California. Uh, this is in the early 70s. And then from there on, I, I, I started studying art because I missed it. I, it's, art was something I understood, actually in certain ways, better than I understood music. It was a time to study music in the 70s. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a tough time. Yes, it was. Well, we're going to cut to, to uh, who are our next artists? That you uh, there us. is, uh, let's see, there is uh, Tim Mockler, okay. who's a painter in the area, and there is also, um, uh, let's see, Joan Ross, and she's an excellent sculptor. And I would like also to take this opportunity to point out that it was Dick Ugaccioni who took these photographs. Okay. These, he was the videographer, and he was uh, quite good. At, he, uh, he really, m many times, captured the essence of what these artists were trying to address. And which was rather difficult. Was it a very short a, clip? You know. Yep. Very hard. Yeah. Yeah. So he really deserves credit for that. Great. All right. Well, let's cut to the next studio. Tim Mockler's. Mm -hmm. Tim Mockler. Okay. One of the things I, I look for in my painting um, is certain notions of beauty. I think. Uh, I think sometimes it's an attempt really just to, to bring to people's attention what we have around here. And, and it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to, uh, doesn't have to be that, that formal sense of uh, traditional classical beauty in terms of landscape or the ideal. Uh, it can be something that uh, I used the phrase once that you see in a glimpse or you see in passing. And I think this is what a lot of the, uh, the literal artists of the area really address essence. Uh, it's just that, you know, pointing out the co what, what we may often perceive as commonplace um, and, and showing it as having some real excitement and some real substance. My term is, I really, I, I pump the color up a bit. I push it. I push it. It's, it's still a perceptual thing, but I run with certain relationships. And there's the drive. And that's that. And that, that for me, that I'm talking the language of what I do. Uh, that's the drive for the color. 
Okay, that was Tim Mockler. Mm -hmm. Now yes. he's another totally different type of painter. Yes, he is. His work is extremely sensual. But it's, it's more than just sensual. It is also utopian. Now, there is no doubt that we live in an extremely beautiful area. Mm -hmm. um, I personally think that the interplay between the water and the, the land in this area is unbeatable. It is. It's a beautiful place. And um, Tim's work takes that, the natural beauty that exists in this area mm -hmm. and amplifies it. To a, to a point where it also becomes an expressionistic experience. So it vibrates a little. It vibrates a little bit. Now, what do I mean by expressionistic? Expressionistic, besides being, everybody knows the term impressionism, mm -hmm. which means that we take the, the beauty of this area and we, we sort of describe it in a way which is very retinal. It is a visual, beautiful visual Softening. experience. It softens it. Mm -hmm. And of course, this area has a tradition of, exp of impressionism. A long tradition. A long tradition. However, Tim goes one step further in that he infuses a type of optimistic emotion in his work, which is really uh, makes it quite interesting and quite an extraordinary experience because um, you're convinced. Y you look at it and you go, oh, yes, well, we can do anything. And if we live here, we can do anything at all. You know? <laughs> it's a re I, I really yes. like his work an awful lot. and, and uh, he, he is a very respected artist. He, uh, he teaches mm -hmm. at a number of places in the area. Okay. Uh, he looked very shy or inward. Well, most artists have a hard time speaking about their work. It's not that they are not, they are not verbal. It is, is that for them, it is such a close experience. It's sort of like trying to describe your own eyebrows. Well, what do they look like? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, it, they're on my face. How can I see? Yeah, let let <laughs> me look in the mirror again. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, for an artist to describe their own work, they have to look in a mirror, and frequently that mirror is not there when you're asking them about it. Yeah, but who else could actually describe it? Who else could uh, bring you there? The, there is a belief that uh, an artist is the best person who understands their work. That's not true. Um, a per, an artist has the most intimate understanding of their own work. So if that's the best, okay. But as I've said before, a work of art is not just what the artist intended. A work of art is a relationship between the artist, the medium, mm -hmm. and the audience. Right. Now, the well, 19th... That, that delves into their psyche, so maybe the, they want to cut that off a little bit when people come their way. Yes. Now, there's, there's an interesting holdover from the 19th century, which is the century that gave us the artist as a uh, great genius, mm -hmm. uh, which that actually that came out of the Renaissance. But right. in the 19th century, artists became it. And we're still sort of uh, living through that as artists that sort of inspired lunatic. Um, yeah, what is it? Yes. The truth is, is that um, art really is a multi-viewer process. And uh, if we, we, with the exception of Van Gogh, uh, we, you know, it really is a, a, a relationship. Okay. But why are so many people alienated from the arts? Because they f feel that they cannot trust their eyes. Now, it is very true that the educated eye is, a, is an eye that is able to read through that which some people may feel is too abstract. Mm -hmm. However... Is that true, though? I mean, is there actually an educated eye? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And, but an educated eye is an eye that has looked at enough art that it trusts its own experience. Okay. Okay? And it's There's also... A balance. You know, and it also doesn't automatically write something off because it's foreign. An educated eye is an eye that looks at a work of art and is intrigued by that which it does not initially understand. Mm -hmm. Puts it into a new facet each time. That's right. All right. One of its own. That's right. Yeah. Well, well, let's take a look at our next artist. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. And now who is this? Uh, this is Joan Ross, and she's a wonderful artist, a wonderful human being, and quite an, quite an entertaining uh, sculptor. Okay. Let's go. I don't want to impose a sense of humor on an animal where perhaps none exists, but my own perception is perhaps more a joy of life. 
and sometimes that comes across as a humorous looking thing. But I think I do that perhaps to attract someone's attention. A little bit of that is to put it in a slightly different position and not one that would be unnatural for the animal necessarily, but just a different way to get people to look at it a little bit differently. Animals are joyous. They do, I mean, look at an otter. He's just taken off. He's having such a good time. I would like people to be able to find some additional pleasure, another source of pleasure or another source of beauty perhaps, if that's I humbly say that, mind you. Okay. I work with marble, I work with alabaster, mostly with alabaster. I work with steatite, which is soapstone, and limestone, and sandstone. They're all extremely soft stones. And the alabasters are on their way, it's a metamorphic rock on its way to being a marble, and uh, they have beautiful veins in them. So if I can play up the vein and have it work in a certain direction for me, and it helps me say what I want to say. On the other hand, if it's a very, if it's a very busy subject, uh, the animal is in a complicated pose, I may want to have a totally flat uh, patinaed rock, a totally flat surface, like a limestone, if I have fur and other details on it. Joan's work was absolutely, absolutely uh, soothing. Yes, well, consider this. What is more unmovable than a rock? Mm -hmm. I mean, even cast iron has more motion to it intrinsically. Yes, it does. But a rock represents that which does not move. Now, Joan has managed to not only have her work move and dance in the most lyrical of a way, but she's actually given it a sense of humor. That's what I find so extraordinary about her work, and is that is, is that here is what was once a rock, mm -hmm. a rock which by nature is that which does not have a sense of humor. And now here is this lyrical, almost musical uh, piece that is comical and yet describes the um, almost humorous nature of. Now, uh, all her works, are they nature oriented? They're all animals. They are. Yes. All animals. And it's, it's hard to decide whether the animals are really animals that would exist in nature or whether they're animals as seen or as anthropomorphized by human okay. beings. Uh, personalities. Pers they all have personalities. Yes, they and they all have personalities that are very similar to Jones. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a nice way to see it. Yes. Well, just like your dog or your cat. You well, the, they do take on your personality. As you're able to see, Joan has a very, very, what I would consider a very um, intelligent and enlightened view. Uh, and that is, is that for all the, um, the ab you know, abstractions and for all the, the depth that life can bring, if, you are, if you're not able to laugh, mm -hmm. if you're not able to enjoy, then who needs you? That's right. You know? And get over it. That's right. <laughs> but she seems to uh, be very etherical and uh, light, lightheaded, like living in the graces, so to speak. Well, the thing is, is that actually she's not. She's uh, an extremely thoughtful and quite a deep human being. Uh, she has learned to transcend uh, the uh, morose. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, but and yeah. and you look at her work, and uh, you you could have just finished reading the darkest of writings of T. S. Eliot, and he goes right out the window as soon as you look at her work, and you say, you know, I'm so glad that I'm alive and not dead. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, take away that deep feeling. <laughs> oh. But so much work right now is being created uh, through the chaos of of time, society. Yes, it We're is. A very chaotic point or a peak, you yes. might say. Now, this is an interesting, this is something that's very interesting. There has been a question whether art itself still has the capability of move, moving human beings in the way that it used to, or whether that kind of experience has been delegated to film. Mm -hmm. Certainly the film uh, Schindler's List, mm -hmm. uh, as well as more recent and contemporary films, has the 
ability to impact a feeling and represent that which we feel. Even if you weren't there. You're, Even if you weren't yeah, you there. Feel it right more to the bone. effectively in certain respects than art does. Mm -hmm. However, however, art does have the ability to focus on something that films never can. Films almost always speak to you. Yes. The news speaks to you and at you. You watch television, you're being told. Yes. You have in, to walk input. toward a piece, of, uh, a work of art. Uh, an art, you know, a really good work of art. You know how you know a, a, yes. there's a really good work of art? It's the one that goes like this. Pulls you over. Yes. Hey, that's right. Here, you know, but you have to walk over there, mm -hmm. okay? But once you do, you're almost always rewarded. Now that's not to say that there aren't works of art that entice you with all kinds of, of, of you know, uh, makeup and, right, and package, attract it, you know, nice the package boat. and all of a sudden you get over then you discover, you know, that you could have had a V8. <laughs> but, you know, the, uh, uh, um, a really good work of art is not the one that, that hawks at you and barks at you and says, okay, come over here. It's the one that says, says well, there's come a, here. There. There's a difference between uh, sculpture and painting, I find, in that facet. Because mm -hmm. painting will burn you out faster because it seems that you have to go in yeah, so they don't always pull you in. Sometimes yes. you have to step in. Yes. And personally, well, I, I find that if it's a good painting, I can step in. If it's uh, if it doesn't do it for me, it's just it, the dimension is lost. That extra dimension. On the other hand, sculpture not uh, most sculpture doesn't have color. Right. So a lot of times they balance each other out. Uh, painting is a two-dimensional experience, Definitely. and it's a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional world. Mm -hmm. That's always problematic. And therefore... But and that's the illusion. But that's the illusion. But also the thing is, that is the difficulty. The artist is trying to, to pull someone into a three-dimensional experience, even if their art is, is abstract. Mm -hmm. An abstract wor a work is a, a representation of an expression, an experience. Of some reality. Of some reality, it's even just if it's abstracted that, off it's reality. A, it is an abstract reality, right? Okay. It has to work within itself. Uh, people uh, a lot of times say, "Well, how does one look at an abstract work? I mean, it doesn't mean anything." Well, all images have a certain kind of energy that that has meaning. Colors, tone. And now, if you were to take this cup down to uh, Australia and show it to some Aborigines, this would be abstract. Yes, it would, because they just <laughs> okay. don't have them. And yet, there is a certain beauty to it. Everything we look at has an abstract quality, except that we know what it means, and therefore, we immediately ignore its abstract quality. This sculpture here, even though it is representational, has an abstract quality. Right. If you're able to look at a piece of work a painting or a piece of sculpture that is purely abstract, the process really isn't all that different than looking at a work that is representational. It's just that you don't have the, the ease of saying, oh, I know what that means. Mm -hmm. You have to look at it as a complete whole, a complete universe in and of itself. And let it work. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what is good abstract and bad abstract? A work of art that is consistent in that which it tries to create is good. And what, I, what do I mean by that? Right. Okay, you can do anything you want, but you better damn well be able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can, uh, the more abstract, the more um, out there, for lack of a better term, okay. the work of art is, the more it has to be consistent with itself. Okay. If a work it of has art to hold its own space. That's right. If a work of art tries, if, if a work of art steps on its own tail, uh, trying to communicate, then all it is it's is lost. a buffoon. I mean, right. it's a buffoon. And we, how many times do we see that? We see people. We see who, a lot of it right now. Certainly, we see people who uh, will express themselves, and uh, especially on, let's say. Rush Limbaugh or something like mm -hmm. that, who will, will <laughs> consistently contradict themselves, but they certainly do communicate. <laughs> they do communicate. <laughs> you know, uh, you can go, uh, certainly the, the uh, I mean, in, to my opinion, the Reagan administration uh, was a, a classic example of, of a great communicator who was, who was completely inconsistent. Well, that's fine for politics. It's disaster for art. Okay. Okay? 
Now, so uh, where do you hope to go? And uh, in the spirit of art, what, where are you, what's happening with this tour that you're starting up? What are you trying to achieve here? There are, are so many creative spirits who live here. And one of the great boons of living here is the fact that for some, for some inexplicable reason, we live in an area in which there is this enormous amount of creativity. Mm -hmm. When people go on the tour and they see the art that exists and they see the studios, etc., they are actually able to leave with a, a deepened appreciation of the community at large. Okay. So is it supposed to educate the people or the artists? Are Education is so tiresome. It, it's it supposed is. To, it's actually supposed to just uh, be a joyful Bring experience. artists to people. That's people right. to artists. Yeah. Uh, things they would never see or have uh, the chance to see otherwise. That's right. You will never, what you will see on this tour is something you will never see in, on, in any other situation. Okay. The creative energy. The creative energy and the space are, which holds it. Are the artists there or do they disappear the, while this happens? The artists will be there and they will be there uh, to answer questions. Mm -hmm. uh, they, all of them are nice people so no one should be shy. Are they going to answer be, uh, questions like, oh, why do you do this? Oh, because you know, I had to or I shouldn't have to have an explanation. No, no, then I, no one, there's no one like that on the tour. Okay. Uh, those people are, are painful. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You know? So they're not going to keep people in the dark. No, they're not. No, as a matter of fact, quite the opposite. It, it is in their interest, and they know it, to uh, illuminate that which they are trying to express. Mm -hmm. They also are quite willing to share with anybody uh, technical questions. There may be a number of artists on the tour itself who who go on and say, "Well, how did? You, what was the? What was the technique? I mean, what was? How did you create this?" Uh, they're not going to say, "Hey." <laughs> That's proprietary information, you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, th they're not that way. Because technique is something that most artists are willing to share. Yes. You know? Because uh, unless you can do it, it's worthless right. to you. The technique is not, is not the thing that makes a, a work of art. There are people who have enormous tec technical ability who have some of the silliest stuff I've ever seen. Yeah. Well, on that note, we have to wrap up. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Well, it's, it's been very interesting. Maybe you can come back also. after the tour or for the next tour. Certainly. And uh, we'll do it again. I hope to. Take a more in-depth look at, at some more artists. Great, great. Thank you very well, much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this has been Art Talk. I'm your host, Jim Tripp, in the spirit of art. And Webster, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.